a bunch of people joining. And um, we'll give everyone a couple minutes just to get out of the waiting room into the main pitch. Uh, and I think as everyone saw, the meeting is being recorded. So hopefully folks can benefit from that in the future. And Nora, just to confirm, are you admitting people as they show up? Or can I we am. just, uh, can we turn off the waiting room or is that not possible? Um, we'll continue to admit all throughout so that folks continue to filter in. Okay, I, I have disabled the um, waiting room, which I recognize is a little bit risky, but uh, I don't know that we would know any better if there was a bad person in the waiting room. No worries, sounds great. Should we go okay. ahead and get things we'll kicked keep, off? So you, yeah, see so a couple people filtering in here. Um, all right, we'll assume you're on top of it. Thank you very much. Um, all right, so thanks for everyone who's joining today. I think we've got a, a pretty um, wide group of folks, uh, many affiliated to the University of Chicago, probably mostly in the MBA program, but we do have some folks from outside as well. So thanks everyone for joining. My name is Guy Turner. I'm a partner with Hyde Park Venture Partners and an EIR uh, at the Polsky Center. I'm really pleased to be able to connect with um, some of you, even though it's not possible to do so in person. Um, so a couple quick things operationally here. Uh, we'll have a, um, the deck is probably about 20 to 25 minutes without any questions. Um, I would like to weave a couple of questions in as we go. So, uh, you know, folks who have some really good questions related to the content can ask. Uh, we will do our best to filter those. I would ask, um, hold any Q&A uh, um, or I guess limit your Q&A to anything that is directly relevant to a slide when we're on it. And then at the end, we'll have as much time as we want for general Q&A. Uh, and so thanks for, thanks for your cooperation there. And of course, um, we can just parking lot any questions that we can't get to. So the topic for today is guiding your startup through COVID. Um, the framework that uh, we're working from is this, uh, what I would call the primordial soup of startups, opportunity, talent, customers, and capital. Uh, and so we'll get to that shortly. I guess to begin with, um, the experience that we've had in the venture world now about six weeks into this is the first four weeks um, of the COVID crisis was spent managing cost structure, preserving and seeking cash uh, and extending runway. And, you know, two weeks or so ago, we all looked at each other and said, okay, well, that's mostly done to the extent we were able to do it. What's next? And, and the obvious answer is that uh, survival really doesn't ensure success. Uh, and so we need to focus on not just surviving, but on success. And our view is that winning comes from understanding how demand is changing, understanding the permanence of those changes, and then ultimately meeting customers on their new terms. Um, in, in short, really, that's reassessing these different, these four spokes, the opportunity, talent, customers, and capital. Uh, and then again, just as a reminder, if you have questions, you can pop them into the chat room. So uh, my basic view on these four factors is COVID impacts them in different ways. Uh, the obvious one where it is a positive impact is talent. There is a lot of, I mean, probably generational um, high point of available really strong talent. Um, you know, not just because we went from uh, a whatever three to four to five percent unemployment rate to what could ultimately peak in the 20 to 25 percent range but because almost every company was affected uh, and there are just some fantastic uh, people and performers and experienced people who are now available um, who frankly haven't been available really for years I mean it was getting very hard hard to hire uh, good folks so that has changed um, we also think that there's a lot of new opportunity in COVID, and I'll go a little bit more into this, but suffice it to say that there are now gaps in the market that weren't there before, either because um, there's a new focus on different parts of the business of business models, um, whether it's more focused now on cost cutting rather than revenue generation after a 10 or 11 year bull run, um, or because you know, there are uh, solutions in the market where there weren't competitors because they, they weren't needs before. So we actually think the opportunity has increased. Um, 
you know, we were another way to think about it is we were at steady state for a fairly long time and at a very high level um, of, you know, economic production and growth, relatively speaking. And because of that, uh, competitive dynamics had um, really solidified so that there weren't that many gaps in the market. And now there should be more. Uh, customers, of course, that's, that's tougher. Uh, most customers in most industries have suffered in some way, and of course, capital is going to get tight. So I talked a little bit about this on, on the opportunity front. I'll go through each of these, but, uh, you know, the COVID crisis just creates new needs that weren't there before. The obvious one is working from home and social distancing. Um, but, uh, but again, there's more weakened competitors, less competition, uh, both in existing need uh, need groups, but also in new need groups. And, and that's kind of a once in a, I don't know if I'd call it once in a lifetime, but once in a decade or once in a generation type of opportunity that the best companies will take advantage of. Um, and, uh, you know, that's, that's, so that's a way to look at the positive. And it doesn't have to be holistic. It doesn't mean a company is, is serving one type of customer in one industry and then COVID comes along and they realize, wow, there's a great customer in a different type of industry that I'm going to go after. There can be really kind of marginal changes. So, for example, um, I was talking to a company this morning that has a, a safety device that monitors manufacturing workers uh, in a manufacturing setting for environmental health and safety risks and um, uh, other safety habit risks. And you think about how the world has changed there, you know, maybe they add to their sensor really quick a proximity warning so that the sensor goes off when they're closer than six feet to another sensor. So that's an immediate need potentially in their industry that they might be able to pivot on very quickly. Um, talked about the talent. Uh, it sort of suffice it to say that there's lots of great talent out there. Um, but you know, most customers are hurting as well, and that's, uh, that's a bummer. Um, we actually put this, these data together um, from a bunch of different sources, probably just a day before the New York Times did it with a much deeper and better staff, but I think we got numbers that were roughly uh, in the same ballpark. And so what we've seen so far is the immediate drop in demand over a period of you know, four to six weeks across industries uh, at median has been around 25%. And there's, of course, some that have been hurt much worse than others. Um, and we'll talk a little bit about how that's in impacted startups in particular. Of course, these are our large industry numbers. And then capital. Um, you know, capital is tightening up. Uh, I'll, I'll explain the venture perspective on that. You can certainly go on Twitter and find all the VCs who are saying, yes, they're open for business and they've signed three term sheets in the last day, blah, 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 blah. Uh, and, and maybe that is true, um, but many VCs have slowed down their investing. The first is they needed to do triage on their existing portfolios. That's mostly complete now. Um, so for us, as, as an example, that's, uh, you know, we feel like our portfolio is in as good a shape as, as can be and, and generally feel good about it and are now starting to spend a lot of time with um, other opportunities. The challenge, of course, is we're figuring out what does it mean to be an early stage investor where we're betting you know, on people and ideas and we can't meet them in person. And so there's some, some at minimum operational challenge. Um, but the best way to think about the venture world right now, I think as an entrepreneur is you gotta understand the money behind the money Limited institutional limited partners, be they endowment funds or um, pension funds, et cetera, they have what's called the denominator effect. So they have some sort of allocation of their overall portfolio that they want to put in venture. Uh, and of course, valuations in venture lag those in the public market. And so as the public markets uh, decline in valuation, the denominator of the overall pool gets smaller and they get over allocated to venture because of that change. The other thing that happens in, in um, the institutional world is, you know, they're always focused on seeking yield. And uh, over the past five years in a bull market, even though there has been great growth at any given point in time, you look at the equ you look at equities and said, well, it's, it's pretty overpriced. Um, not sure there's yield here. And so you push more and more of your capital alternatives and private investments. And that trend will probably reverse a little bit in the down cycle where um, there's more volatility and, and there may be more value opportunities. Um, then what this ultimately leads to with VCs is that our fundraising cycle will probably slow down. 
So um, the average VC was starting to raise a fund every 18 to 30 months, and that will start to move to every 24 to 36 months at least, um, maybe even higher. And so if you say our, the, the deployment cycle has increased 50% or the uh, fundraising cycle has increased 50% on average, that, that means if you do the math, that deployment rate drops by 33%. So holding all things equal, there's going to be fewer rounds and or smaller rounds happening in a period of time. And um, I think the data will, uh, will show that quite clearly by the end of this year. All right. Um, so, th so that's kind of the, the major stew that we covered here, these four items. What I'd like to do for the rest of our time is focus on demand and demand signals because once you've managed your capital structure, um, once you've right-sized, uh, if you needed to do that, once you've found access to more capital through PPP uh, or maybe your inside investors, and you feel like um, now you can survive, you gotta figure out how to thrive. And that's gonna be through understanding, ultimately in the long run, changes in demand, um, both in the MEDC, but also in how those changes will stick. So it's interesting, There's if you, if you talk to folks a, a month ago, most people would have said after COVID, everything will return to normal. I think people are ex, uh, understanding more and more that this is a protracted cycle and a, a protracted human experience. And when you look at other protracted human experiences in the last century from the Great Depression, World War II, financial crisis, um, the other one that could have been on here certainly is 9-11, you realize that there are some real changes in customer behaviors, interests, and demand um, when those periods were over. So the Great Depression is a really interesting one because uh, in terms of some of the metrics, that will be the most like the COVID crisis with respect to unemployment. And out of the Great Depression came the New Deal, the social safety net, uh, social security, um, regulation of capitalism, and um, international isolationism. And do, will all these things happen now? Don't know, uh, but certainly feasible that um, socialism is is a bigger factor in the country than it has been already started after the after the financial crisis and the Bernie movement and so on and so forth. Um, but could certainly see that going continuing. After World War II, we also saw uh, more return to traditional family norms and mores. And and again, here I'm not opining on uh, on. Uh, gender or sexual affiliation or anything like that. Personally, I don't care who sleeps with whom and who marries whom. I'm talking about the institution of having a, uh, a core family group that um, lives in a home and has kids and maybe isn't in the city, things that have been changing a lot over the last uh, decade. And, and it's possible that we could again see uh, a return to the family unit as, um, as a, a critical factor. And then, of course, financial crisis, we saw uh, a lot of um, uh, stunted millennials who are still living at home. We, we're going to see that again, not necessarily millennials, but now uh, the generation after, whose name I always forget. Um, and after the financial crisis, we also saw an urban rebirth. And I think there's some questions now in the long term with the realities of social distancing um, as, as to whether that will continue. So these are just big factors to think about in other crises. And you can ask yourself, okay, um, are we gonna see a recurrence of any of these or other factors? I don't know the answers, uh, but it's important to ask the questions uh, and especially one specific to your business. Certainly if you were in real estate or finance or any of those major markets, these specific trends could be really impactful. Uh, but if you're in a more niche market, there may be another set of trends wholly that'll be impactful. We've heard a lot of talk about what a recovery looks like, what the timing of a recovery looks like. And it's important to have a perspective on that because as a startup, you want to react both to near-term demand, but then start reacting early to uh, longer-term changes in demand. Uh, the checkmark model is the one that seems to resonate the most with me right now, personally. Um, everyone's hoping for the V-shape, which is everything goes down and then quickly comes up. I guess at this point, it would be sort of a U shape, but I think the check mark state, uh, uh, um, pattern is a little bit more likely. So we had a steep decline, uh, and now that we're near the bottom, things are continuing to slow down, but slowing down slower. Uh, and then when lockdowns open up, don't know when that'll be, but maybe in Illinois, for example, will be in June. There'll be some sort of very 
a quick increase in activity, especially in different markets, um, not every market, but many markets. Uh, and then that activity, uh, change in activity will slow down um, and it'll still be impacted through this, what I'm calling a pre-vaccine era. Um, so for example, things like movie theaters and concerts and big events seem very uh, unlikely. It doesn't mean that those venues won't be open, uh, but I'm not sure that many people will show up as an example. And then post-vaccine, my belief is that there's still going to be this inertia effect of a lot of these new habit changes and social norms, um, even after a vaccine is available and, and coronavirus is no longer a threat. And so that's how we are looking at it from a demand perspective. And then you can kind of simplify the stages of that check mark into uh, what I'd call the main effects. So what are the main effects that are impacting every industry? Um, that's kind of what I've covered here. Right now it's uh, work from home and social distancing and uncertainty. Uh, but then you can move to post lockdown. You've got still unemployment, perhaps family as a social center and support, economic and social caution. And in the long run, which as I noted here, I'm pretty much making up perhaps a traditional uh, 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 trading in the experience culture for uh, what matters and could lead to more uh, traditional um, marriage and having kids and all that kind of stuff, uh, or maybe a move to socialism. Now, the reality is none of these are known when you look that far out, and I'm guessing just as much as anybody else, but it's important to think through what your beliefs are and then to prepare for the things that you may not be prepared for. We'll, we'll talk a little bit more about how to do some scenario analysis to do that. So let me stop there and would encourage anybody to um, add any questions they have into the chat. Any questions? No questions, okay. That's either really good or really bad. We'll keep going. Um, so as we look a little bit further, you know, again, we've seen this drop in demand we talked about. Um, I won't, I won't, uh, focus on that too much. The question is, how has that impacted startups? Um, what we've seen is um, transactional businesses took a very quick hit. So marketplaces, anything that had exposure to at-risk industries like uh, travel and so forth, um, you know, took a very, very quick hit, but now have probably mostly reached bottom. I mean, for example, in travel, 96% decline in air travel, like there's no chance, uh, well, there's very little chance that's gonna decline much more. Um, and so transactional businesses are, are probably at their nadir, uh, and then the question is when the lockdown ends, how quickly will they recover? Um, hopefully a little bit more of a, of a V-type recovery for some of them, although not all of them. What we've seen is that recurring revenue businesses, like the many software startups that we invest in, they have a massive amount of inertia in their revenue base. Um, and so they're slower to decline and will also probably be slower to increase. Um, right now in the B2B side for recurring revenue businesses, we're seeing uh, new sales decline pretty precipitously, uh, typically down 25, sometimes to 75%. Uh, and those can be downsizing of customers, a contract to have themselves downsized, and those can be um, customers who have fully churned. And the B2C side, you know, speaks for itself. There's lots of experiential uh, recurring revenue businesses like gym memberships that are, you know, quickly declining. Um, and we're also seeing renegotiations, contract renegotiations across the board in enterprise software. So our, our view is that transactional businesses will recover faster, but probably to a new lower level. Um, and recurring businesses, as much as inertia has prevented a steep drop, will also create a slower recovery for them. So we got a couple of questions here. Um, one was thoughts on accessing PPP. Let me cover that one at the end, because um, it's not uh, specifically germane to the slides we're on right now. Um, yeah, okay, so that's mostly on the PPP side. We'll come back to at the end. And then what sectors do investors have more appetite for now? What are your investment bets for the next 12 months? That's a really good question. Um, so I would say that 
you know, so clearly anything that's gravely impacted like travel and uh, all that kind of stuff is, is, is pretty bearish territory right now for investors. Um, it's sort of obvious to say that there is um, pretty increased, uh, significantly increased performance in anything collaboration related. Uh, but I don't, I don't think it's a great time to invest in that because I think most of it's overpriced or overhyped. Um, I would look at things that are a little bit less obvious, like supply chain security, um, you know, the supply chain, the food supply chain and labor supply chain have the, the critical importance of those and their continuity has, has really come, become very clear in this crisis. And so I do think that um, enterprises, when the recovery comes, will be very keen to making sure that their supply chains both for physical objects and also for human capital um, are more secure and they have more control over them than in the past. And that's a long-term, that would be a long-term bet as an example. Um, I will come back to PPP at the end. So this talks a little bit about how we see a reopening occurring. There's been more conversation about this. Um, Suffice it to say that uh, Georgia opening movie theaters and concerts on Monday seems nuts. Uh, my personal view is that those types of venues, even if the venues are open, will not be meaningfully attended until 20, well into 2021, probably um, approaching the time when there is a vaccine or, or otherwise some sort of herd immunity. Uh, but I think pretty soon we're gonna start seeing uh, schools or summer camps, that kind of stuff open in certain states, parks, and slowly things will reopen. Um, but reopening is gonna precede uh, human comfort in a lot of cases, I believe. And so, you know, it's gonna be a very long cycle and um, any business that has exposure specifically to, you know, these ex mostly experiential categories um, or, or retail categories is gonna take a while. Um, got another question here, territory wise, um, let's see, I can't quite read that. I'm going to try to expand it. Territory wise, shall we invest more in the, on the business with Chinese market? So I think the question there is, you know, China seems to be recovering earlier. Should we invest there instead? I have no idea. I'm not a international investor, so I really can't answer that question. Um, it's a, it is a great question. I, I think what I would, um, the question that I would ask is, uh, to what extent is China any better positioned to avoid a recurrence of coronavirus than anywhere else? And that answer is not clear to me. Um, and so I think most investors are going to be very selective about what they're investing in, um, uh, you know, under, under the assumption that coronavirus is no longer to be a problem in China. I think that feels like a stretch uh, until there is a vaccine. Um, so in the meantime, I think um, looking for specific value areas in investing. So for example, me personally with my personal assets, um, we'll probably be looking to things like at real estate towards the end of the year when uh, you know, mortgages have defaulted and assets will be probably become quite a bit cheaper in, in exceptional cases. You know, that feels like the type of value investing that makes sense almost everywhere, regardless of territory. Um, so one of the things, you know, I like to look at is post vaccine, why should we expect any difference? Well, we talked about, you know, the major changes in uh, that occurred from a World War II or a financial crisis. Um, but there's some really interesting data uh, from 9-11 um, with respect to, to travel and tourism. So. And 9-11, um, the existential risk that people perceived of a terrorist attack in New York, um, even though, to be honest, New York by then had probably become one of the most safe places in the world, um, international terrorism didn't recover or international tourism didn't recover for five years, uh, which is pretty extraordinary. So there, there is a, a really long inertial effect to these types of impacts. Um, although there, what was interesting is domestic tourism stayed relatively constant, didn't increase, but didn't really go down. And so there is this kind of stay with your own for safety concept that I think um, could come out of coronavirus as well, uh, which has some analog to what happened in 9-11. All right, so what do you do now? Um, 
you know, again, you want to you want to understand whether these major trends could affect your business or the industry that you're in. Um, it seems obvious, but I think there's going to be wins for everything that's e. So e everything from e shopping to e commerce, that's fairly obvious. Um, but there's things that are less obvious. So uh, supply chain security, which I point out a little bit here in both durable and non durable manufacturing and shipping. Um, and then my personal belief is that we've reached this peak experience. Um, uh, you know, the experiential economy, which came out of um, partially out of the financial crisis where uh, a lot of millennials were very discouraged about the institution of home ownership uh, and also the on-demand economy and the sharing economy allowed people not to have to own assets and to substitute experience for assets. Um, I think that, uh, you know, we may be seeing a peak in that, number one, because travel is going to take a serious hit for a couple of years, but also because people are measuring what's important. And I think at some point, people ask themselves, um, is it more important to have sat on a beach in Thailand for two weeks? Or is it more important to, uh, you know, have two kids that I love and are going to take care of me in the long run? To be fair, it's not one or the other. Some of that is life sequencing. But um, at the margin, people will, will make different choices because of this experience. All right, a couple more questions here. Um, let's see, let me maximize this. So there's one question here, which is, are the assumptions about the future you see being made in the current climate by entrepreneurs that they tend to really disagree with and why? So. Are there things that entrepreneurs are doing or seeing that I personally disagree with? You know, it, it's an interesting question. I, I think um, for any given company, um, you know, in some ways, investors are already always betting for or against the company when they decide to invest or not invest and, and thereby uh, betting for or against the entrepreneur's perspective on the world. Um, but, you know, to be honest, I think we mostly trust our entrepreneurs to know their markets better than we do. So I'm, I'm loath to uh, certainly our existing entrepreneurs to be uh, too ju judgmental of how they view the world. Um, I think, to be honest, that most entrepreneurs are still figuring it out. And so I think that there's lots of um, opinions and views, but they're not closely held. Um, just as, you know, my belief about a, a peak experiential economy is not closely held as an example. Um, there's a couple other questions I'll take at the end. Okay, I think I'll pop through the rest of the slides really quickly and then uh, cover the, the remainder of these questions. All very good ones. Thank you. Um, let me hop over to the slides. Okay, so the, the most important thing that I would recommend you do, and, and, and you know, this is always a question of what do you do in the face of extreme uncertainty, is do a scenario analysis. Um, this is something that uh, is taught at different booth classes as an example, and you might roll your eyes, like when do you actually do this? This is the time when you do a scenario analysis. Um, scenario analyses are really good when there are multiple states of the world um, whose probability is uh, either somewhat um, equally spread or is just generally unknown, and you need to figure out how you're going to survive in all those scenarios and also when those scenarios are very different. So in the growth, uh, in, in the healthy, stable growth economy that we just came out of, um, there was a lot of convergence between future scenarios, meaning that it wasn't that hard to look ahead for six months, three months, one year, two years, and you know, believe you had a good view on what the future is gonna look like. Now, to be fair, if you were sitting down doing a scenario analysis a year ago, coronavirus, probably was not on your radar. But now that it is, what the future looks like um, has a lot of divergence. And so a scenario analysis, analysis can be really helpful. In this case, I'm using a really simple example. Um, I'm, I'm saying there's a startup that sells a point of sale software to restaurants. 
And so for them, um, you know, you look at that company, you say, okay, well, there's two things that really, really affect this company in the future. And I want to look at different scenarios of these two, uh, of these two independent variables. So the first is how long social distancing lasts. So how long it's um, kind of a requirement or at least prudent, um, not necessarily uh, a requirement from the government, but at least prudent. And then the second is um, how consumers' preferences for meal venues evolves over the over time. Do they does this um, event cause them to eat in a lot more, or will they return to uh, extensive eating out habits? So um, some of you may know that over the last 20 years, um, in home dining has uh, sudden or just recently lagged behind out of home dining. Um, and there was a you know, sort of big crossover of that trend and I think it was 2017, 2018 and um, massive difference from where it was 20 years ago. So will that continue or not? So you name, you set probabilities and you consider a world for each of those two by two scenarios. So four scenarios. And um, what you do as this company might, might greatly vary depending on which scenario happens. And probabilities are important because you know, you, you probably want to temper any investment you put behind a very low probability scenario. Of course, you're all saying, well, what about coronavirus happening? I'll come back to that in a second. Um, but for the most part, you, you, you want to think about expected values. And so there's the back to normal scenario, which is essentially everything returns to normal fairly soon. There you're just cutting, keeping your burn low and surviving to the end of the tunnel. And at the other extreme, you've got the scenario where, um, uh, social distancing lasts for 24 months, and that partially reinforces uh, consumers' return behavior to wanting to eat at home in the long run. And so if that's the case, you may actually want to pivot or expand your products to meet the needs of ghost kitchens um, that end up supporting a lot more home delivery. And in this case, I said, okay, I think the probability of that is 25%. So as, as a business owner or a startup founder, I want to, I'm going to look at this and say, okay, well, it's a, it's a one out of four chance that the world uh, uh, ends up like that. I'm, I've already got my back to normal scenario covered because that's what I do already, but I need to start investing in this um, uh, one out of four scenario to a certain extent so that I can be prepared if it happens. And that's what we've encouraged. And many of our companies are already doing this. So we've seen kind of four main strategies for uh, quickly reacting to COVID and adjusting. One is repurposing assets. So we have a, a 3D printing company that very quickly dove into the, to the medical market and has been producing masks and ventilators and things like that. We have uh, companies that have been giving away a product that has a unique immediate value to customers to deepen a relationship with existing customers or establish a relationship with prospects. Both G2 and Four Kites have done that. Um, and then there's an, another mode, which is selling to your customer in a new way or through new channel. So our company Fixer, which is a handy personal service on demand, um, is now uh, selling its services through video. So that's a new way of doing that. And then um, we've also seen several of our companies try to help their own customers sell to their customers in a new way or a channel. I know that's a little meta, but uh, in the case of Fixer, they are direct consumers, so they are selling to their customers in a different way. In the case of Talk and Second Kitchen, they are um, B2B to C or they're B2B, and so they're trying to help their businesses, customers. Um, just a couple ways of looking at it. And that's pretty much it. Uh, you know, suffice it to say, in times of rapid change, it's riskier to not take risk than to take it. And that has really changed for all companies, not just startups, over the last couple of years. I think startups uh, generally always have this view. Um, but even a more mature startup may start to uh, get a little, a little bit embedded in their ruts. And so this is just a good reminder that right now every business needs to take risk. Um, so that's that. I will go back to the Q&A and hit some of these questions. All very good. Um, So there's one question about uh, crypto. I don't know anything about crypto, so I won't answer that. Um, basically, they're asking, how do you evaluate um, investing in crypto in the next six to 12 months? And uh, your guess is as good as mine. Um, are there local healthcare startups or HPVP investments that are well positioned to vault forward? 
Uh, we are fortunate to be investors in a telemedicine company called Zipnosis, which has um, had a massive amount of impact with customers and consumers uh, since the virus started. So I guess the short answer to that question is yes. Um, I have another question. Yeah, so one entrepreneur um, who's on this call brings up a, an interesting point, which is they're having to slow down their product development in order to reduce burn, and yet they're worried that this is actually a time when you'd want to accelerate uh, so that you can get a competitive edge. And that is a really interesting trade-off, and I, I guess I would say two things. First of all, obviously, um, you know, necessity is necessity, and if you have to cut burn, that's how it goes. But the other thing is that depending on what need you're going after, if it is a um, unique discontinuity in the market created by COVID and there's really severe pain around it, the question I would ask you is, does the product have to be as, as good as it normally does when you launch it in order to address that need? So to give you an example, um, our CEO at TOC, uh, TOC is an online uh, reservation system for high-end restaurants. We had a great conversation about this recently, and Nick said, you know, as soon as our restaurants all, you know, started shutting down, we realized that we needed to help them enable online ordering and pickup. And these are high-end restaurants that never really did this before. And um, they decided to launch a product in seven days. They did it in six. And I said, well, how did you do three months of work in six or seven days? And he said, well, we didn't. We did probably 10 or 15 days of work in six or seven days and we didn't worry about the rest, which was to say that products at this exact moment in time probably don't have to be quite as perfect. Um, and you may not be able to charge as much for them either. Um, so uh, another question here on gig economy uh, and um, manufacturing diversification. So on the gig economy side, you know, it's interesting. I am probably slightly bullish shared economy. So things like sharing cars and sharing homes, uh, you know, vis-a-vis -vis a get around or an Airbnb, I think those will have some headwinds, not complete headwinds, but some headwinds because um, social distancing has created a reality where people just fundamentally don't want to touch things that other people have touched. And I think we will get somewhat habituated to that. But sharing services, so the, the gig economy of delivery and so forth, I think Right now, it's pretty hard to say that, um, you know, there isn't an increasing opportunity for those in the market for two reasons. Uh, number one, because um, right now we need a lot of home delivery. And number two, there's massive unemployment and, and the gig economy is a good way to, um, to, you know, pick up work on the side. Um, manufacturing diversification. I do think that there will be manufacturing diversification. Um, is it going to be like a 10% GDP bump to the U.S. over 10 years because everyone brings their medical mask manufacturing back to the U.S.? I don't know. Uh, but I think that um, supply chain continuity is, as I mentioned earlier, uh, going to be a really, really important factor for um, businesses' risk disposition in the future. And so I would expect some manufacturing to, to come back to the U.S. because of that. We talked about um, venture capital markets before, so I don't think I'll address this one, but suffice it to say, I think access to capital from VCs will be reduced, not you know 90%, but maybe 25 to 30% over the next couple of years because their own fundraising cycles are protracted. Um, let's see. Okay, and then there's other people sharing their opinions on things. One person in particular who seems to know a lot. So um, next time, maybe we can have them on a panel. That's it so far. Oh, what's your view on mezzanine financing? Um, I'm not an expert on mez financing. That's more of a mature business uh, financing vehicle, so I can't help you there. Um, so I will stay on for a couple more minutes in case anybody wants to ask more questions. Um, really appreciate everyone joining. appreciate the Polsky Center 
setting this up and, and giving us the opportunity to connect today and um, look forward to meeting more of you in person down the road. And oh, uh, PPP, someone asked about PPP. Okay, uh, so the Paycheck Protection Program, uh, many of you have heard of, it's been all over the news. Uh, what do we think about that for startups? So we think it's great for startups as long as the startup has real need, meaning that, um, uh, meaning that their demand has been reduced meaningfully. How do you measure that? I would say drops of, re you know, revenue drops of 25% or more are probably a pretty good story um, should, the, should the loan be audited at some point. Um, and the other way that I would think about it is, are you going to do something differently with respect to your personnel and your team because you get the loan than if you don't? In other words, if you're going to lay off 30% of people without the loan, but you're only going to lay off 15% of people with a loan, I think that um, is pretty good justification. Now, you should talk to your lawyer. You should read everything you're signing in detail. I am not a lawyer. Um, I know there's been a lot of mixed views about PPP amongst venture. First, it was everyone was rushing towards it. And then it was, everyone's going to get sued to oblivion because, you know, because they're going to get money that they didn't actually need. Um, you know, I'll be perfectly honest. I think that a lot of the VCs are getting worried about PPP more for their own optical reasons um, than because of risk. Uh, but that said, there are certainly companies that are, are pursuing it that shouldn't and don't really need it. And that's not what it was meant for. So I think be honest and um, uh, be thoughtful about whether you have a real drop in demand and whether you would really do something differently with your cost structure if you didn't get the loan. And document well. Um, yes, you can get access to the slides. I will share them uh, or, or the Polsky Center will send them out to all the registrants. How will VCs or angels be thinking about pre-revenue or pre-product investments given the decrease in capital? Uh, that's a good question. I, you know, it's funny. I think for us, um, we will probably be more aware of follow-on um, capital risk. But to be honest, we're Midwest investors, and so um, access to follow-on capital is always one of the bigger risk points versus a company that's in California. And I, I do expect that we will continue to do pre-revenue and pre-product investing. Um, I would say, and I think that's true of most seed investors, I would probably think that some of the mid-stage funds that started to go earlier will sneak back out uh, to later stage as they perceive more value there. Um, what do I think about real estate and construction for the rest of the year? I think it's going to suck. That's what I think about it. Um, I don't, I don't know, um, how far down real estate closings are, but I suspect already probably 20%. Uh, construction, that will follow. Uh, and there's two reasons for that. The first is if you are bullish on work from home, then you might start to believe that you don't need as much office space. Now, that seems like kind of a, a very strong statement. But remember, we're not saying that every business is going to stay home, even if just 5% of businesses decide that work from home actually work really well and they need less of a footprint, that um, has a, a really big effect on the construction and, and um, office market. And so, you know, uh, those things, uh, small changes that ha can have outsized effects. Um, because in an inventory market, you have millions and millions of square feet. And the fact that 5% of that is suddenly open means that it could actually collapse the construction market for new space. Um, okay, I think that's it. Really appreciate everyone's time. Uh, and um, we will share definitely the deck and perhaps the recording. I think that's up to Polsky Center. And uh, thanks again for, for everyone's time and to the entrepreneurs out there, thank you for everything you're doing. Um, we truly believe that from the ashes will rise some uh, amazing and phenomenal companies as is always the case. And we hope to be part of them. So reach out to me and let me know if you wanna talk about your company. Thanks.
Thanks so much, Guy. We really appreciate um, you sharing this content with us today. And as you mentioned, we'll circulate the recording um, and a copy of the slide deck with all those who registered. So for those who are looking for additional remote content through the Polsky Center, please um, check in with our website. We have lots of workshops similar to this covering a range of topics um, that are available during this remote time. And we hope that you're able to tune in. Guy, thank you again uh, and all the best and good health to everybody. Thanks everyone. Thanks, Nora. Thanks, Erica.